All right. Good, good, good. Hey, guys, as you know, I um, announced last weekend, but I'll say it again. I'm going to be out from the pulpit for a few weeks here just studying for Romans coming up in the fall. Who's excited for Romans? I am telling you what, I don't think I've ever been excited to preach something that I am this. So just brace yourselves uh, because I'm loading up with things to say, and I'm excited for it. So uh, be praying for me in that, too, if you guys would. Pray that God would speak through me even now in the study. I believe he's in the study, Yes. And uh, we need him there, meet him there first uh, before we see him here. And so we praise God for that. But be in prayer for that. We've got some great people who are coming to preach God's word to us in the meantime for the next few weekends. And kicking it off is none other than Pastor Greg. Greg, would you come on up here real quick? This is uh, Greg. He's our pastor, our Congregational Cares pastor from Casper, our Casper campus. Would you guys welcome him today? Thank you. If you want, you can call him Mr. Smith. Because it's just a sweet last name. You were calling me Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith. That was my dad's name, my grandfather's name. Hey, if the I'm shoe only, fits. I'm only 32. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm, only, you. I'm only 33. Okay, very All good. All right. Thank but you. I'm telling the truth. Okay. <laughs> Lightning bolt. Greg, uh, just sure appreciated working with you Thank this you. past couple of years. You're a blessing to the, the whole congregation and a blessing to our campus Thank as well. You. Thanks for coming to preach for us today. It's an honor. Thank appreciate you so it, much. All right. All right. Very good. Yes, sir. Hey, thank you guys so much for the privilege of being here this morning. I am just delighted and honored. Um, every once in a while, they prop up the old guy, and here I am. So, <laughs> but it's uh, it's a pleasure. I got I got to tell you, just and forgive me for for taking some pictures around here. While a few minutes ago, I, two reasons. One is I have to go back and tell Mike I was really here. Okay, so <laughs> you, you should witness that. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, and uh, in addition, just to be able to show our folks what God, some of the great things God's doing and just to capture the spirit of this worship and, and, and to see this room bursting at the seams. I've got to tell you a couple quick stories and we'll get right to the message. Uh, several months ago, a few months ago back, uh, we brought a group of our, our seniors up to Heart Mountain and uh, Arlie was gracious enough to open the church so that we could show them this as well. Many of them hadn't seen what was going on in place. But there's one lady named Beth, okay, who years ago had gone to church here for 13, I think it was, years, okay? And she worshiped here, was active in leadership, and, and to bring her through this place and to see the joy in her face and look what God's doing here. And that was just looking at an empty building, okay? She went from place, I taught Sunday school here. My son's graduation was here. And then we walked into this room. It's like, whoa. Now, church, obviously, is much, much more than a building. We get that. But it's evidence evident, rather, of uh, the great things that God's doing in this place. And I'm so thankful and so proud of your pastor, a great, great man of God. And I want you to continue to pray for him. I want you to support him. I want you to follow his leadership. He's God's called shepherd to this place. And we're so thankful that God placed him here. And equally, I want you to pray for his wife, Meredith. Behind every good pastor is a spouse. My wife Shirley's there. She's been with me in this deal for 46 years. <laughs> Gosh. But I wouldn't be the man that I am today without her support, her, leader, her, her leadership, and her support, rather, in, in our home and, and in my ministry. And to kind of have her grab my hand just as I walked up on the platform just made me all more thankful for this woman. And I'm so thankful for, for Meredith as well. So, so I, did, I did realize something, I think, uh, to, to my dismay for a second, <laughs> I, I realized I think I sat in Meredith's seat. Okay. <laughs> so I'm kind of sensitive to that because years ago when our kids were young, when we were going on vacation, we used to try, if we were off on a Sunday, we used to try and visit a church someplace and, and it was our, our pattern. I think it was in Massachusetts or someplace in the east anyway. We went to a nice little wood frame church and walked in, very beautiful building. And um, uh, we were there early because we didn't know exactly what time to start. So we went in and found our seats and sitting and waiting, and in came this woman who I'll call Mabel. I have no idea what her name was. And this is absolutely true. Okay, so she walked up. We're sitting here. She walked up the aisle, went to the seat in front of us, turned around, and went, <sighs> <laughs> well, there's the love of Jesus for you. Thank you. <laughs> so we, uh, I had some Jesus conversations in my head that probably didn't, was just as well not coming out of my mouth. <laughs> So thank you for not doing that, Meredith. I appreciate that. <laughs> so let's pray. Father God, I'm so grateful, so thankful for your presence in this room. Thank you for your spirit, which is just unmistakably here. Where would we be without you, God? 
and for the honor and the privilege that you've given us as your children to gather together in this place to worship you, to celebrate our relationship with you, to thank you for new and eternal life in Jesus, and just to, again, proclaim that you are the way maker. Thank you, Father. So may the words that come out of my mouth be yours, and may the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our God, our rock, and our Redeemer. And God's people together in Jesus' name said, Amen. Amen. So every once in a while, many times in, throughout history, many, many, many more times than we even know or made evident to us, God has this way of just doing this profound and outstanding and powerful and unmistakable move of God. He gathers uh, he works together, rather, moves together in, in, in our midst in ways that we see and ways that we don't and delivers us and heals us and strengthens us and restores us and in many senses of the word revives us. You know, revival is a word that's kind of a little more vogue these days and it might have been in days past. You may remember back in February or so, <coughs> February actually 3rd, Eighth, rather, uh, a, a massive revival broke out on a campus of Asbury College in, in, in Kentucky. Started with just a, a, a service of praise and worship. The guy who actually led the message <laughs> that night said it really wasn't all that good of a sermon. Okay, that's for him to say. But at the end of the message, as I recall the story, a young man got out of his seat and came down to the altar and began to confess his sin and to ask forgiveness of God and to praise God and, and, and how God had worked and was moving in his life right there. And that began spark that night every student in the room night after night after night God began to move and before it was all said and done over 50,000 people had come to that small town of Wilmore Kentucky of about 6,000 folks to catch and to experience this powerful move of God and it was a phenomenal, incredible thing. If you saw any of it on, on, on TV or watched any of the videos of it, awesome. Actually, this is about the third revival like that. It happened in Asbury, if I remember my history correctly. One was back in the 50s. Uh, the other one was in the early 70s. And my wife, Shirley, was at the time attending Anderson College in Anderson, Indiana. And the revival from uh, Asbury there broke out and came to Anderson with some incredible works, even her own life, her family's life, friends of ours. How God transformed hearts and moved in, in, in incredible ways. And, and he's doing the same even with this one. For now that I understand there's revivals that have broken out in Lee College in Kentucky, in, in, in Tennessee rather, in Cedarville College in, in Ohio and Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama, town where we live for, for several years. And while God moves, and we'll talk more about this in a, in a moment, the full impact of what God did from February uh, 6 to, April, to February 24 is yet to be measured. But two things of importance came out of it. In addition to everything, every soul and heart that was touched in, in, the, in, those, in those live worship periods of time, is that the university folks wisely said, you know what? It's time now for this to cease in the way that we know it. Yes, we were concerned about security. and there were, I mean, you take that many people, it'd be like double summer crowd in Cody, okay? Or I used to live, Shirley and I, in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. Who's ever heard of Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania? Yes, sir. God bless Punxsutawney Phil. All right. This guy, this little groundhog, lived for 200 years because he took the magic elixir, or else they found him back at Bill Daly's barn. I'm not sure exactly where that came from. But anyway, a uh, little town of 6,000 right, 6, or so people, depending on whether it's on a weekend or day, to increase from, uh, to a population of either 20,000 or 30, 36,000 people in, in two days' period of time with one hotel. It was an amazing thing. <laughs> and obviously, that many people, it was hard to control. But more than that, the university folks, that the, the president of college and others, wisely said, you know what, this phenomenon that's taking place here is incredible, it's awesome, it's the mountaintop. But really, revival that's begun here can't just stay here in this, in this beautiful edifice. So revival that's begun here needs to spill out into the streets and it needs to be evidence of transformed lives, not just of the, for the folks who are in this room, but the influence that came from the Spirit working and saving and transforming and moving in some, some awesome ways. We see God's hand at work. 
And as we continue the story of, of Nehemiah, lo- I love this, this book. I love how, a, 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 a tremendous uh, example of how with our God, there's nothing impossible with God. Broken, crumbled walls that had been down for decades. Now re- Nehemiah helped to rebuild, led the rebuilding rather 55 days. What an incredible story. And you, our Pastor Arley, I'm sure, has talked about it in some great detail. But also, we see the powerful, redeeming, restoring, forgiving work of God, transforming into people's lives. So here we are today, following the story. It's about a 70 or 80 years later after the folks, the people of, of God had been tr- transported into captivity because of their own sin and, and, and lawlessness. But now God had begun a, a way back to Jerusalem. He came first with Ezra and a couple of waves of groups. And they came back to their dismay. As you know, the walls were broken down. And it was a, a, not only just a, a symbol of shame, but also was a, a, a loss of security in the sense that these had to be resurrected in order for uh, the city to be safe. And in order then also to really have folks recognize that these are the people of God that live here. So God called Nehemiah there. You, you know the story. And so the walls are rebuilt and... Ezra, who had been there before, began to read from the, from the book of the law, the Old Testament as we would call it now. And as he read, which I loved, it was like for hours at a time, you think a 30-minute sermon's bad? Try six at one pop, okay? Well, you're standing, he's sitting, but that's, that's another issue. <laughs> but God began to move and stir in the hearts of the people. They were convicted of their sins, even sins that they hadn't committed, but commit, convicted of the sins of their forefathers that had brought them into the spirit of captivity that God was delivering them from. And there came in, in this great time of celebration as, as Ezra read from the word and, and the choirs were brought in and, and uh, all that took place there became a marvelous time of confession. And some promises were made. We repent of our sins, God. My paraphrase, we'll talk more in a minute. And so in honor and in, rec- in rather recognition of that, here's some promises that we made. And there were many of them. And as a matter of fact, if we look at, at uh, chapter 9, beginning with verse, I'm sorry. I got a new Bible and the pages are slim. Sorry. Oh, yeah, okay. Chapter 9, verse 38. Here's the list of promises that were made. They were put together, and I have two short passages uh, to read to you today. Uh, And so in chapter 9, verse 38, in view of all of this, the people said, the promises, the, the, the conviction of sin and the promises that we're making to him, we're making, we're making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders and our Levites and our priests Affix their seals to it. They wrote them down. It would be the same thing as a, as a notarized document. They were sealed. And then they listed all of the names of all of the people who signed this document. And they're all right there for your own reading in your own time. And I said, thank you, Artie, for giving me, Artie, rather, for giving me the book of names, okay? <laughs> when you have a name like Greg Smith, anything else is hard to foul up, okay? <laughs> so... And they made a long list of promises, not the least of which being that we promised to, to take care of, to not to neglect, rather, the temple of God. And there's some great significance of that in a moment. When we look at what took place there and continue to take place, and you'll hear more about this in the, in the weeks to come, we see promises made. Lives who were once dead, restored, resurrected, and brought back to life. Revival took place in the land. So what's revival mean? I love the, the definition Andrew Murray wrote of making revi- saying revival this, is making alive again those who have been spiritually alive but have fallen into a cold or dead state. One more time, the definition. Making alive again those who have been spiritually alive but have, been, have fallen into a cold or a dead state. Men, women, people who have been alive and on fire for Jesus... And for whatever reason, as the drift began or those things that begin to take place or Satan begins to nip it at, at heels and just try to dissuade instead of encourage, and we begin to walk away and wander back and left unchecked, our hearts become cold and distant from God. He hasn't moved, we have. Revival then is taking those cold, broken, 
bound up hearts. So I'm going to bring life again to you. Took place in that day. And it took place and can take place in our day. So I've been thinking a lot of reading and thinking of late about the presence of God. And certainly it was the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about that in a moment as well. But people love to come into the presence of God or say that they are in the presence of God. I know Jesus. I love Jesus. Okay, I've met, I've met him. I've been filling all the blanks. But the power that comes in knowing God in that way is lacking until they experience what's called the manifest presence of God, where the power of God is so strong, so immovable that you can't get away from it, you never forget it, and, and you can't be, uh, and you're bound rather to move in a way that he's leading. Transform lives, brought back to Christ. So as we look at, at Nehemiah's story in, this, in the chapter that we're continuing here, there's actually some, uh, an anatomy of revival, if you would, excuse me. So what, did, what took place? How did that revival, that experience of renewal from the, from the time of captivity and bondage brought back to the city with the walls rebuilt and, and as the story goes? What happened? What are what, what, so kind of the elements of that revival, if you would, as we look at their story and as we look at ours as well? First of all, true revival is brought to pass by and only by the Holy Spirit. True revival is brought to pass by and only by the Holy Spirit. Now, admittedly, the day of Pentecost has not come yet and where the rushing mighty wind and, and Acts chapter 1, verse 8 and the power upon you, but God's Spirit had continued to move since the beginning of time. And God's Spirit was moving in incredibly ways as he's moved together and put the people of God together in a place where he wanted them to be. And what took place with the rebuilding of the walls, what took place in this time of dedication and consecration, I should say personal, was brought to pass by the Spirit of God in response to God's word. Ezra read the word of God and the conviction that came from the reading of that law, which I, I know I said a moment ago that many of these folks had never heard and many of them were not even born uh, but when the captivity took place. And here they're hearing for the first time, thus saith the Lord. And it moved their hearts and it stirred them and it transformed them and they fell on their faces before God revived. You know, revival is not something that we can whip up, okay? It's not something that we can control, that we can direct. Certainly God uses to put elements in places, to put things together to bring revival to pass, but his spirit that brings, the spirit that we felt in this room this morning was not just something that some guys came in and said, here's what we're going to do off a piece of paper. While there was, I mean, there was some preparation done, but it was the spirit of God that moved among, them, among us. The spirit of God that moves among us as well there. When I was a kid, we used to have revival at our church, okay? Good thing, nothing wrong with that. Uh, for when I was a little guy, it was two weeks at a time. <laughs> then we had down to a week at a time, and everybody came every night, and there was a guest preacher, and the word was, was proclaimed, and, and God moved, and people were, were, were moved to, 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 uh, to the work of the Lord. But in a sense, that wasn't revival. That was spiritual renewal, and that was great. Revival is not something that we can say, okay, God's going to move on August the 13th of 2023, and we're going to have that well planned, and I'm a planner, okay, I would, I would have this thing planned to death. But revival is birthed by the Spirit, and absent His power, we're going through motions. So what if God were to continue to bring revival to this place? To you guys, to me. In a sense, we could use the definition of revival as, as to what was, what, what, what was finished here and God brought back to life and renewed and restored and, and empowered. <clears throat> so we're in the midst of experiencing a revival here right now. But what about, <clears throat> pardon me, in our individual lives? What if God were to move in such a way that it was unmistakable that he came to you and, and brought his power upon you such it says, I want to do this. I want to transform your life. I want to, I want to raise back to life that which is dead inside of you or around you. How would we respond to that? Whether it was a, an individual talk from God, and I, I've never heard God speak audibly to me, but I've heard many times, many, many strong promptings. Okay. So what if we were to prompt to you and to say, Arlie, Here's what I want to do in your life. Shirley, here's what I want to do in yours. 
How would we respond to that? Would we be afraid of that? Would we feel unworthy of that? Would we, in a sense, reject that? And what could be the, would we be willing to, would not do so rather because we don't want to release control? What might be the result of that? Or what if we were to say, yes, Lord, yes. Where you're moving, where you're leading, I will be faithful to, and I will follow you. What could be the impact here in your life, in your home, in this place? How could this community be, continue to be transformed as a result of the work of God doing in your lives and mine in this place? And what if we were to say yes, Lord, in a, in a call that we're to, to, to move in ways that you might not have planned? And I think very, and I'm uh, very, uh, direct, rightly rather, of a young couple about three or four years ago. God began to prompt in their hearts in their lives. So here's what I want you to do. It's not all clear right now. Here's where I want you to go. Here's where I want you to be available. Here's how I want you to be faithful and obedient. And I'm going to bring great result from your yes. And there's your young couple sitting in the front row. Spirit moving. Spirit transforming. In response to the word. So another, another a part of the anatomy of revival, if you would, is that it's birthed through uh, praise and worship. The scripture tells us how the Levite choirs were, were rounded up and the, and the celebrations and the praise to God were, <clears throat> were incredibly made in massive recognition of God and who he is and what he's done. Worship is not just a precursor to the sermon, or worship is not, worship rather, is not just merely singing some of our favorite songs because we like them and, and they make us feel good. Worship draws us into the very presence of God itself and prepares us for a move of God. This morning when we sang about the way maker, he is here moving in our midst when we sang about how you are worthy of our song, you're worthy of our praise, God. We come into your presence, we worship you, we wait upon you. You're moving, you're, stu- st- uh, you're, you're moving and you're leading in ways that we never expected when we came in this door this morning. And worship opens the heart to God's presence. And, and, and worship allows us to speak to God, to tell him how much we love him, how great he is, our, our love for him, and, and is so grateful for his love and his faithfulness to us. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His tender mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord, Lord, Lord. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, from which the great hymn of the church, Great is thy faithfulness, came. We worship you, Father. We're allowing you, even through our worship and our praise, to hear from you. And it's not just singing, but particularly so. When we come before, and revival is birthed in worship and praise. I know there have been times, I've not personally experienced it, but I know there have been times from stories I've heard where worship is taking place and the move of God is such that the preacher never got there because it's an outpouring of God poured out upon that room such that, that the sermon in that moment at that time wasn't necessary. Revival is birthed through worship and praise. It also begins, rather, excuse me, also, also begins, excuse me, with confess, confession and repentance. There is no revival taking place without confession and repentance. It doesn't happen great evangelist of a couple of generations ago named Gypsy Smith, no relation to me, was asked one time, oh, how, do, how can we get a revival started? And here's his, here was his answer to the person who asked him a question. I want you to stand still, take a piece of chalk, draw a circle around where you're standing, and when revival begins in that, spe- that circle, then revival has begun. Again, we can't just schedule something. And we can, but but God usually works through unusual ways, but He only works through hearts that are confessing, confessing rather, uh, and repentant. The Israelites, as we talked a moment ago, were confessing their sins. They were confessing the sins of their forefathers, knowing that that they weren't even there, weren't even responsible for that. And they confessed and they repented. And repentance means more than just a verbal affirmation of saying, I'm sorry. Repentance means very specifically, I'm going to stop this behavior and I'm going to turn around in the way that the Spirit is leading me and moving me. 
and in a way that God directed. And that confession and repentance allows us to come before God with a clean heart, as David said. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Renew a right spirit within me. Lead me into your way everlasting. You know, today, revival could just possibly break out here in this room, in your home, in your life, if you were to, as the Israelites, as the people, uh, as people God did rather, uh, to acknowledge and confess some sin that takes place, make that commitment to turn from it with the Holy Spirit's power, what would happen in your life? God were to say, you know what, here's an area of life you haven't given me control over. I want you to, I want you to confess of this. This is a blockage between you and me. How might God move in some incredible, awesome ways that you've never before experienced? There's a good way for revival to begin. Revival also, another part of the anatomy, if you would, continues through daily sanctification. Now, I had to put a big word up there so you could know how smart I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. What does sanctification mean? We, it's a word we throw around in church a lot, particularly in Church of God circles and whatever. It means very simply, back in the old day, the days of Moses, when the articles of worship for the, for, the, uh, for the tabernacle were prepared, they were ceremonially cleansed and they were set apart for holy use. That was their express purpose. You know, we come to the place in our lives where Jesus, where we, where, the, where we accept Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, and he gets us. We get him, rather, I should say, as, as some would say. We confess of our sin. We ask him into our heart and our life. Okay, if, if we were to die right at that moment, we'd be in heaven. No question. But then the Spirit begins to move in that newly confessed heart. And say, so, Greg, I want you, I want all of you I want to take you, your heart, your mind, your, your body, your words, your actions, your reactions, and I want you to have them cleansed and set apart for holy use. And what if that were to be, what if we were, allowed, were to allow rather the Spirit to do that on, on a daily basis? Some have called that sanctification thing a second work of grace, and I agree with that. But in my life, it's been a second work of grace. It's been a third work of grace. It's been a fifth work of grace. It's been a 25th work of grace. It's on and on my life goes to where I'm more and more beginning to take on the character of Christ. That'd be my life goal and my, uh, <coughs> and my uh, affirmation. A daily surrendering. It says, okay, God, I'm committed to you, not just to make this decision here, but I'm committed to give you every facet of my life. And wherever you want to go with me, whatever you want to do with me, however you want to work in my heart and my life, I'm yours. I'm submitted to that. Holy Spirit, take charge. Not an easy thing for us to do in our individual lives. But the Spirit then says, I'm going to begin a process of transforming. I'm going to begin a process of cleansing. And I'm going to do that day after day after day after day. So that when we have the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, sin's no longer the master. And that relationship with Jesus at that point in time is just beginning. So that we hear some contrasts as we look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and following. So I say, walk by the Spirit. Allow yourself to be controlled by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. And they are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do, what, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit... You're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, craft rather, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and empty envy, rather, drunken, or, uh, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But here's the work of the Spirit. The fruit or the evidence of that work is love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have been crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with 
the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. And then finally, the anatomy of revival says this, it results rather in daily transformation. What I once was is not what I am now and not what I will be in the days to come. My dad, uh, a railroader worker, uh, blue collar worker in, in Pennsylvania, um, lived a rather tough life before he met Jesus. He wasn't, well, yeah, it was a tough life. And he, uh, in a Sunday evening service in a church of God in distant Pennsylvania, in response to a message that was preached that night, went forward to an altar and was saved, dramatically saved. And came away from that experience, not the same guy ever. Now, not a perfect man, I wouldn't want to try and apply that. But I talked with a lot of the, some of the guys who used to work with him on the railroad, and there's, there's things, we don't know what happened to Smitty when he got religious, religion. And he's not the same guy. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. And they respected him for that. And he's just one example of how in his life, and I guess he wasn't perfect, my goodness sake, but his was a life of ongoing transformation to where people said, if you had known him then, not the same guy. Now, we're not talking about behavior modification here. But God will transform your heart. And evidence of that transformed heart is a transformed life. And evidence of transformed life is a revived spirit. Revive spirit. So we hear the last word of the scripture that, out of Nehemiah that said, and we promise to protect the spirit, the temple rather of God. What's the temple of God now? My heart, your life. So how are we protecting that through ongoing transformation? And what will be the impact of that? Like I said with the revival in Asbury, it's, it's much too early to understand the full effect of that. But one day, we'll be able to look back and say, because of those days in February of 2013, look what God did in the midst of a broken and crumbling nation. And who knows what will come from the hearts that were transformed in that day, in that time. So I say to you this morning, how's your heart? How's your heart transformation? What's the condition of your heart? Now, sad to say that with the people of God and those days of high exaltation and the promises that were made and sealed and, and, and signed and sealed, I should say, it only took about a year for all of those promises that were made, many of them, if not most of them, began to crumble. Nehemiah left for a year and he came back later. He had a lot of correcting to do and you'll hear about that, I'm sure, in some future sermons. But that's, you know, how does that work in our lives? I, I used for several years a, a study called Experiencing God. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with that or not. But in that, in that study, they have a, doing kind of a case study on the people of Israel, how there was a life cycle of revival in their own lives and how God... Uh, God uh, worked in some specific ways, but we can see ourselves. If we could put that chart, chart up here, please. There it goes. So a diagram of revival. God, through his called and chosen people, if you look at the block down there, arrow going back up, is on mission. God's on mission, and he uses God's people to do that. And what he has them to do is to redeem the lost, first to have a spiritual awakening, and then to redeem the lost. That's his call for you and for me, for each one of us. But we're all human beings, as were the case with the people of, of God. While they were on mission with him, something somehow took place through the influence of the, of the evil one who loves to kill and seek what he, what he can devour and destroy. They began to depart. And afterwards, God would, would stir their hearts many times using discipline. Being 70 years in captive in Babylon was, uh, was an example of that bit, bit discipline. And so after we're disciplined, we begin to cry out to God. And God hears us, okay. and we have an opportunity at that moment when we cry out to God is either to, either to repent or to perish. And the result in perishing is judgment. The result in repenting is revival. And then he renews our hearts such that we're back on mission with him. I would ask you this morning, this is a rhetorical question, not for anybody to answer out loud. Where are you on the life cycle? 
Where's your heart? And as we look at that, we see here the, an example of a redemptive, a restoring, a forgiving, a graceful, merciful God who gives us that opportunity to, uh, to turn Yet he's also a just God. This is, if you make the decision not to, there's consequences there. But I'm thankful in my own life that in those times when I've departed and he's even disciplined as such that he said to me, I love you, I forgive you, cry out to me, and I'll put you back in, on mission. And, I, and I'm thankful that he has. So question is in closing, where are you in a circle? And how will you respond and what will be the result of that response? Hearts ablaze, a fear, an awe of God, a life that's transformed and set apart on mission with God. God says to you and to me this morning, in this place, you're experiencing revival. Now what will God, what will we, what will he, what will we rather allow God to do with that? We're thankful for his faithfulness. Thankful for his hand in his church. Thank you for how this community, the state, the nation, the world can be transformed by your obedience. And God saying, to God saying, yes. Might our prayer be, God, you're the God of revival. Restore our hearts and all of God's people in one voice, in Jesus' name, together said, amen.